I would like uh, doc, uh, to pass the microphone to Dr. Branko Burns, who will give in, who will be giving a welcoming message. Thank you for joining, everybody. Muy buenos días, uh, hola a todos. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining the series, this series of uh, Simit Brownback seminars for 2020 in this uh, webinar format. This has been an overwhelming success. The last one we had over 150 participants and we are today 74 and counting. Uh, we welcome especially the CIMIT regional offices that are joining to this uh, webinar on a more uh, decent hour for, for, for all of you. So we adjusted the time to have also your participation. This and coming webinars will also be available and live streamed and, can kept on, and kept on our YouTube channel at CIMIT webcasts for future visualization and visits. We would like to uh, ask all participants to uh, put their microphones in mute during the presentation. Please note that questions will be received via the chat on the Zoom, or if you are uh, tuning in through YouTube, uh, so you can uh, also uh, transmit them uh, to our speaker once she concludes her, her presentation. Today's uh, webinar will be presented by Carolina Camacho, uh, and the title is Social Inclusion in CIMIT Research, Latin America Lessons for Future Actions. Carolina uh, is an expert in social inclusion and innovations from the CIMIT Social Economics Program. And I, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Olaf Ehrenstein, director of the Social Economics Program, for his support to all her research and her participation in many, many projects. Carolina is an example of uh, what we want to achieve uh, in T-shaped capabilities in CIMIT, where we want to integrate multidisciplinary backgrounds with uh, action on the ground. Carolina has worked in multiple projects in CIMIT uh, across different programs. She has a background in agronomy, genetic resource conservation and utilization, as well as sociology of rural development. She has been studying in the tropics, uh, such um, uh, systems such as traditional farming systems, agrobiodiversity and technological changes on agriculture. She has now with, been with CIMIT eight years and she has been working on innovation processes within the context, especially of the Masagro projects and other projects implemented in Mexico. Recently, she has been coordinating efforts to promote social inclusion processes based on gender, age and ethnicity into these projects. And of course has supported uh, the learnings and the, and, the, and the replication of those efforts in Guatemala and Bolivia. Complementary to these, in collaboration with the Maize Seed Bank, she is promoting projects on maize land trace rematriation, a concept that introdu was introduced uh, as an innovative approach uh, to achieve uh, agrobiodiversity con uh, conservation and rural development in a complementary manner. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bram, for the presentation. And as you highlight, yes, um, I want to thank the opportunity that I have been having within the, in the context of the projects that IDP lead for developing and for having these lessons of social inclusion. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Olaf and, and Lone for the opportunity that they have been giving me and the team for developing capacities in the topic of social inclusion, that it was a topic that, I, that we didn't really manage at first, but we have been moving forward and we, we are looking for becoming experts in the field. I assume that I will put the video, that says indicate me. So the idea, this presentation, I have been structuring into, into, into sections. In the first, the first section is really more an introductory section for putting the, the uh, for, for framing why social inclusion and for also trying to discuss a little bit this concept in relation with gender and why we're using gender and social inclusion. And the second part of the presentation is more related with uh, the, the title that is the lessons in, uh, that we have been learned from the different projects in which we have been working in this topic. So I would start the, um, let me see. I hope that everybody can see it well. We check it beforehand. 
I will start with a video. Uh, the video is this uh, overall wall of the SDGs that is lo leave no one behind. And I think that it's an important message for understanding why social inclusion and gender is important in our work. I hope that there is not problems. Um, uh, the sound it's it's relevant for the context, but basically the things that you need to know are, are written. So I hope that you can listen. It. refugee in Pakistan, I was refugee in Iran, I was refugee in Dubai, and now I'm a refugee in France. Les gens quand tu es handicapé, ils n'essaient même pas de voir ce que tu es capable de faire, mais ils te jugent à travers ton handicap. Haberme vendido no fue una buena idea. Porque se todo mundo tivesse alimento em casa, ela podia raciocinar. Então, poderia ser pobre, mas teria inteligência na cabeça para poder sair dali. Porque eu não quero muito, muito. A zona missiona é onde eu vou te lá. I've left my husband to be with a woman, and for me, that's a huge step in my country as an African woman to do that. I do have a strong voice, and I'm strong as a woman speaking for myself. Nous devons dire au monde que nous existons, que vous êtes là, et je suis sûr qu'aucune misère, aucune pauvreté extrême n'est pas une fatalité. On peut la combattre. So um, CIMID is committed to 10 of the 17 SDG, and by that it's also committed to this um, overall goal that is no, leave no one behind. So you, you can wonder, well, how does this translate in, in, in the work um, that we are doing? Sorry, I... Mm, yeah. Stop it. And that's the point that we are, as, as a gender and, and social inclusion unit, we find that for, for, for advancing in this leave not one behind, we have to accept three propositions. The first one is one that perhaps some of you have been seen from Lone, and it's idea, this idea that agriculture is a social practice. And that means that even though our work is in a lab, we should not forget that the impact that we are looking for is going to 
um, occur in a social context in which agriculture is taking place. In this social context, there are some opportunities. There are people who have, and the conditions are that some people um, have access to opportunities and some of people know and not, and we have to be aware of that. And that awful, awful, we don't take into account it, this affect the way that the impact that uh, our work is doing. And those, those, we are asking that when we designing technologies and interventions, we have to do it in a way that they are not only technically, but socially robust. That for breaking the barriers that are, 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 um, are constraining the fact that some people can access or not to the benefits and the products that we are doing. In that sense, yes, although we arrive with technologies to a farmer, the farmer is part of a family that in, uh, that in which social relations and processes of inequalities are occurring. And those are also, uh, and the family is part of a group and from that, from a market. So we have a, a system approach that now CIMED is using with this agri-food system in which we have to recognize that agriculture is a social practice. In that sense, the, social, the second proposition says that we have to think that innovations are not neutral, that as we arrive, we develop a technology that be, will generate benefit and that's why it becomes innovation. That's not, that doesn't occur in the vacuum, but in a social context. Agricultural innovation approaches and scaling is it's, it's strong in saying, this is occurring in a social context. What we are complementing is that this is occurring in a social context in which inequality is occurring as a daily basis. And we are not new on that. There are, there are authors who have been referring on that since the 1976, um, calling for um, or taking into account that innovations have an indexing for social people. They can favor some social groups over other groups or that we have to be careful and, and try to develop equitable diffusion strategies. In the, two, um, in the 2000 decades, uh, authors like George Rogers himself, who is the father of the diffusion of innovation, have been recognizing the diffusion of innovation, have, uh, that we did it, it occurred this socioeconomic gap in which innovation makes the richer in a better position and the poorer in, a, in another. So we have to attend that. And that's why concepts like, like narrowing the, the gender gap, it's very, very important. There's also literature that try to capture all these things about exclusion that they are happening in innovation. That's why concepts like local innovation that brings this idea that farmers are also innovators or responsible innovation that things in innovation in the terms of the future, but also in terms of solidarity or inclusive innovation that brings all these poverty discussions uh, to, to, to innovation or just innovation that, that also brings the concept of social justice to, to understand and to improve the way that innovation is having. All these elements in some way or another are the evidence that innovation are not neutral and that we have to stop believing that our technology are Know through by that and will benefit to everybody. The third proposition is, is related with the fact that as, as we are not entering to a flat soil, uh, there are different unequal opportunities for people to innovate. The Genovate study um, on, that compares norms worldwide gives a, a good example for that. Asking male and female innovators about what are the influence for their capacity to innovate, we found out that uh, although there are some similarities in relation with personality traits of self-esteem, self-confident in both of them, as both of them rated very high, there are some differences that are important to highlight. For men, as, as the case of, of, this, um, of Samuel from Zimbabwe, if I'm not wrong, uh, he says that what has been very, very important for him has been this near connection with extension agents. As uh, if, if there's any problem that he has, he can go with them and they will support them, him. Ofo Bilma, who is from Ethiopia, considers that, yes, it's an extension agent. This is important for her. Uh, the, the support that she receives for her husband is very, very rebel, relevant, making evident that for her, all these things about gender relations are playing a very, very important role 
recently, in fact, when we were doing field work in, in Oaxaca for, for a, a new project in which we are working, and we were asking women how we can engage them, how we can include her, them to the project, they were telling us, you need to talk with our husbands. We need the support of our husbands. We need that you engage them and that you convince them that, uh, that we can participate. We need that even you, you discuss with them gender, gender issues for stopping them being so machistas. So the challenges that they have are different and that's important to take into account when we want to promote technological change. So in that sense, um, um, uh, we think that gender and social inclusion are complementary, and we want to highlight that in some way or another. And that's this part of the presentation in which we talk about gender. Gender has been highly associated with women. And that's also because of all these work that feminist uh, studies have been doing for highlighting the inequalities that exist between women and men. Uh, Women and gender is a universal category. And in that sense, there are women in men worldwide, differently to other social, what we call social markets, like for instance, case that is only occurring in East Asia. Gen, um, gender and women, the difference between women and men are present all, um, everywhere, no? It's also with the feminist approach, um, talks about science as a transformative um, activity giving us the opportunity to think that our scientific endeavor, our research is contributing to making a better world. So it's very in line with what Simon is looking for, you know? And moreover, it's the gender equality represents the, the, the fifth SDG of, of the, 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 the fifth SDG. And in that sense, it's also something in which Simit is committed directly we are looking for contributing to the SDG. In relation with social inclusion, social inclusion is very attached with social exclusion. It's like you cannot include something that is not excluded. So it's, on, it's in some way or another is antagonic and is related with literature about mar the marginal, the vulnerability that are also attached with poverty studies. Um, in that sense, um, there are different entries to social inclusion, and that make it a very fragmented category, because uh, uh, a social market, for instance, disability, that it has been a way in which some governments, like the Mexican government, has been discussing social inclusion. It's only one category in which people can be um, um, engaged. But there are others that, that doesn't have the coverage of, 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 of gender. No? It is also a broader term in terms that we are trying to capture a process, the social inclusion and exclusion. And in that sense, it can bring us to other topics that are not necessary with our social identities. Let, let me give you an example of it. Uh, someone was very, very kind to me uh, when the person knew about the, this seminar, uh, um, the person wrote me and told me, oh, well, how, how are you thinking discuss social inclusion, no? Because there are different ways. And I was telling to that person, well, you know, I will discuss it in the terms of social identity. And the person replied to me, well, it will be very interesting to, to, to discuss the social exclusion that land race have land races have been having within the context in CIMIT in some periods of their time, in which in some programs, like the initial years of Masagro, land races were not considered. And after, they were included because that was necessary. And in some way or another, the fact that we don't engage and we don't explicit in and communicate that we are working with land races as we are doing with the work that Marta Wilcox is doing, with the work that Denise Kostic and I, we are doing with the rematration, makes the idea, or, uh, and it's very local here in Mexico, that we are not really engaged on genetic resource conservation in terms of land races. So the issue with social inclusion is that it's very broad, and sometimes it's very difficult to manage that. Even though it's also considered in the um, in the tenth SDG that is related with the reduced equality, that's why we consider that both categories are complementary because when it is needed in, and depending on the circumstance, 
we can be as sharp to target the category of gender and we can push for gender and transformative. But when it's needed, that other ca significant categories come in place, like being indigenous or like we being, being poor, well, not poor, but being, for instance, um, age youth, uh, that becomes um, uh, more significant to, 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 to the approach of social inclusion and exclusion. So we don't have a problem really to see that one competes over other, one covers other, or that can be the overarching concept of others. Complementary, they give us a gaming situation that any of the separated will not give us. Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, we see that sometimes biological and social difference plays a role in the person. So for instance, yes, I'm a woman, but I'm also a, a, an urban middle-class woman of Mexico City. And the way that norms or rules and practice shape me for being in the position that I, I'm now are comp completely different that, that the roles, the norms, rules and practice that a, a Mexican woman from a rural, rural area and indigenous will have in such a way that the inequalities that I have to confront and that I have to fight on are completely different to the ones that, they, that, that these indigenous women will have. So the fact that we use both gender and social inclusion sharpen our approach to, to the way to attach to one thing that we want to do when we work in the topic. How, how we ensure that uh, inequalities are not affecting the access to the opportunities and the benefits that CIMIT is doing. So that's the question that we're looking forward to answer each time that we're working in gender and social inclusion. So now let me move to the second part of the presentation. In this part, I will talk about the lessons that we have been learning. But before that, I would like to refer to the projects that have been giving us opportunity to learn this, uh, these lessons. So as a landmark, I want to to say that it was 2013 when the gender unit was created, now called Gender and Inclusiveness um, Unit. And from that year, we have been working in, within Masagro in the topic of gender, first by making a study on women participation in, in agriculture during that year, and later engaging as a Mexican case of Genovate in 2013. And since 2018 until, uh, until this year, at least we, we have clear that we are promoting this topic within the context of Masagro in Mexico. Uh, another project that gave us the opportunity to work in the topic and, and as a line of action, in fact, was uh, the Buenamilpa project sponsored by USAID, the Feed the Future Buenamilpa project in which we develop and we implement a social inclusion strategy. The, the, co the project runs, runs from 2015 to 2018. And in the last year, we were able to reflect in the lessons of um, implementing this uh, strategy within the context of the project. Some of these lessons, we also enriched them with other experience like Masagro, but also with the project in Milpa, Yucatan, in which we also develop a social inclusion strategy I and mean, the project finished last year and it has been also very enriching to the process of, of le learning how to, to do social inclusion. Um, two new projects are also, not, also opening up the opportunity to, to discuss about this topic. One of them is the IFAD project on conservation of agriculture and crop livestock systems in arid areas in, in Asia, in Africa and in Latin America, in which we are looking to feedback the, uh, for ensuring the inclusion of women and youth to target groups that are very, very important for the project. And finally, the second project is the, Masa the, second, mm, the second phase of the Masagro Guanajuato project in which we are including a component, uh, well, we are mainstreaming social inclusion for having that perspective to the project. And in this second year, this second phase that it will run until 2024, um, we are looking to make a big difference, uh, a significant difference for not leaving anyone behind. So from that, we are, I'm going to present you like a dis distilled version of the lessons uh, for not overwhelming you with too much. The first one is related with reevaluating the impact of, of CIMIT work on complex social phenomena such as poverty and hunger through the, through the lens of social inequality. 
we have our own understanding and the, the way that uh, the work of CIMIT is, is, is impacting poverty and hunger. But when you start looking poverty and hunger with the social inequality lens, you start realizing that there are elements more than technology that, that, that can be important for in, our interventions. Give me, let me give you an example. For instance, in the case of these women that are telling us that we need to engage um, uh, their husbands and in terms of gender, in, um, gender transformative approaches, how do we frame that in a project that is focused to develop technologies? So are, can we talk, can we include gender, gender training in that? If what we are assuming is that by, the, by that technology, we are going to um, certain out these complex issues about poverty, it is allow the, the sponsor will allow us. So how we, in, with using this gender lens, we can, a uh, social inclusion lens, we can start bringing elements that are not necessarily directed with the innovation process or the technology changes, but with the social context in which we are working. The second uh, lesson is identify consequences of CIMIT innovations and how they can affect social dynamics. And it's very related with our second principle that innovations are not neutral and that we have to aware how those innovations land in the, in the context, in the, in the social context in which we are working. Uh, this, this, this landing is not in a plain uh, feel, but it's in an ovarian pain thing, and we have to be careful of not harming those, especially the most vulnerable. So that means prevention and have a previous reflection of how we are developing these innovations. In relation with that, it's that we need to develop capacities. It's not uh, that you one day wake up and start seeing all this inequality uh, processes that are happening in the social context. That means that you have to break stereotypes and stigmas that you have about social reality. And that means that we need to develop capacity in, in this topic of social inclusion on the CIMIT team and on the collaborators, because if not, it will be very difficult to talk with them without having that element um, with that. And related with that, it is the fact that um, that it, also we do efforts of our raising and training as we have been doing beforehand in this cost, in this context, they have to be integrated through the project. One of the, uh, especially, well, in one of the projects, one of the things that happened us is that our training, our courses were so isolated that it was very difficult to bring them into practice in the techni technical arena, no? Because uh, there, it was a completely disassociation. So people start saying, well, yes, I'm learning this year, but I cannot apply it in practice. And that is related with the other element, the other lesson that it's, that into practice means that it has to be, it has to appear in the project objectives, activities, outputs, outcomes, and even budgets. Recently, we were discussing with a project how to bring the social inclusion and the gender, and they were saying, but that's not the way that they measure us. That's not the end outcomes that they are expecting for us. So yes, how much there is an institutional commitment for this in such a way that is expressed in the projects to facilitate the inclusion of this perspective in our work. And, and if there are challenging things because at the end it's like, if you want to include groups like women who have difficult challenge that men, you have to be able to sacrifice perhaps numbers to change the way that you're doing things, to be able to say to the donor, well, okay, yes, I will not achieve these numbers because I'm engaging in a conversation with groups that are vulnerable and that they need a special way to move forward. No? So that it has to be expressed in the projects. And finally, the, the last lesson is more in the way that we, as social inclusion team, we work, that, uh, that we have to work with you for, for sharing, for starting growing a uh, shared understanding on the topic. Because uh, it's a topic that it, it is not an easy topic and not neither a comfortable uh, topic. And if we don't have a shared understanding of it, it is very difficult to ask you to, co incur, to, to commit on it. So we need really, really to, to talk more on it, to discuss more on in it. And that's the reason why, one of the reasons why I'm giving this, well, the most important reason 
what I'm giving this seminar to start a conversation with all of you on social inclusion for you feeling that you understand it more and that you can commit more. So I want to finalize showing you how social inclusion looks like in practice no? for some of you. It looks like doing research to try to understand, especially in spaces where family farming is happening, what are the roles, what is the participation of women and men from different age in farming activities and how they have been engaged in, in, in innovation process, how, if they have been having access, if they have been not having access for informing the projects, how you can include them in a different way. It, it is also, it has also implied to, to bring out the social inclusion perspective to work that colleagues like Santiago Lopez Ridaura has been doing on farm typologies in which they recognize that the differentiation within the farm types, but it's giving this social lens to sharpen and to start asking questions like, is productivity looks the same and means the same to all the farm types of Mexico? Or we can have to take some considerations of the productivity that commercial farmers are thinking on versus subsistence farmers, maize farmers. The other thing is starting also questioning our approaches. So one of the things that we have been doing is asking what happened after three, four years that we established our plot trials, demonstration plot trials that we call modulos in, in, in the hop model. What happened with the community, with the impact in the community? Who is included and who is excluded from this process of innovation? And why are the reasons? We don't stay with the idea of saying that um, persons who are included uh, tell us always like, it's, it's because the others are not interested, but we go farther and we start uh, asking the excluded people why they are not participating. And there are a lot of things re related with inequalities in their answers. We, there, we are, social inclusion also looks like training and we have been doing training in different formats for these models in which we were discussing as part of the, of the capacity of, of, of the training activities of the projects in which we discuss social inclusion to specific to, um, um, trainings for topics such as masculinities, masculinities, that it's very, very important in our sector, or to a whole course on um, social inclusion that we were able to promote to, we were able to implement in Guatemala with the collaboration of uh, um, uh, um, FLAXO, that is a scientific uh, institution in, in, in Guatemala, in which our collaborators who were practitioners from the ministers, from NGOs, were able to have a six month course of social inclusion for having a better approach to improve their, their, their practice, their interventions with communities. It is also look at mainstreaming and mainstreaming in different levels. We start with the basic things or reviewing formats in which for trying to capture the diversity and seeming is committed to to collect disaggregated information and that disaggregated information have to be collected with these formats. But it's also including how we help collaborators starting thinking in activities and how those social inclusion looks in actions. So we have a whole review about collaborations and we started making some um, proposals of how collaborators can integrate this topic within their collaborators. We went, we went further last year within Masagro and we tried to unpack and to say, well, okay, if we are really working in food security and hunger and poverty, how much we have to discuss and create a common understanding of how we as, as an institution, we are going to, we are attending poverty and we are attending hunger. So we have some short tags within the team, with the team of Masagro for starting discussing this complex phenomenon that we are looking to attend. We are also ambitious with the um, second phase of Masagro Guanajuato we, we, because we, are, we, are, we, we want to mainstream the topic from, from the theory of change. So we are reviewing the theory of change. We, well, we were planning to review it with the COVID um, process affect us, but we hope that on June we will be able to review with the team the theory of change and from there start including the social inclusion perspective for instance, the, the core of the project. It looks also a lot as communication because the topic gives a lot of space for discussing about stereotypes, bias, and we have been doing a good work with um, uh, 
the, the um, dissemination team within the IDP program, making videos and, and also we have been also doing a good work with communication, uh, corporate communication, making a, a point about uh, how systems like the MIMPA, it's a family endeavor, and how we, when we work in these systems, we have to involve all the family members and also make evident and, and recognize all the work that we in, in the different projects in Latin America, but especially our collaborators are, are having for integrating to are, are doing for integrating this topic. It looks also uh, as thematic as we have been doing to try. We are very interested to work with youth. So we start more in a documentation stage of how in, in different spaces within Masagro, youth uh, have, been have been integrated in the projects like formal and not formal education schemes. But we have been also, especially thanks to the Milpa Yucatan project and to Vladimir Mai, the opportunity to concretize this work with schools in which we establish plots with students, in which we also use those spaces for making activities in which we engage students. And we were able to have a whole experience of what does it mean to work with institutions for including uh, young persons in a topic like Milpa. It, it has been also the opportunity to discuss how we include indigenous people, and we have been focusing on indigenous knowledge, especially the, the two Milpa projects has been voting that. So we have been documenting traditional knowledge on harvest practices, and we have been trying also to link that with within this agri-food system approach to the food, to the food of the Milpa, but it's also very important for food security terms now. In, in the context of the Milpa Yucatan, what we did was start documenting also local innovations, what local innovators have been doing. And, and as uh, climate change is a very, very important topic for farmers, what we did was gather information about local innovation on weather and climate prediction. And, and we also collected information about rituals. Rituals are important in two ways. One of them is for recognizing in the, in the arena of recognizing indigenous as, uh, and their cosmogony, cosmology. But the other one is that in some cases, these traditional, these rituals are part of the traditional knowledge that farmers use for, for instance, in the case of the Mayas to, to classify clouds. And now by based on those clouds, how the rain will come and how will be good or bad for the, for the milpa farming. So with these points, I would like to finish this presentation, but not without really recognizing that it has been a collective effort in which a lot of people who have been part of the social inclusion team have participated. Also a collective, uh, uh, an effort in which the gender unit, an inclusive unit now has been very, very supportive and especially a collective effort of all the team. Thanks a lot, Adair, Gloria, Ale, because it has been a very enriching process of discussion for really, really finding a, a way how social inclusion can contribute to the mission of CIMIT and not leave not without leaving anyone behind. Thank you for the for the time. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, we have a first question here uh, from Dr. Thomas Payne. Uh, we are sometimes told that CIMIT must remain apolitical. How can we influence social inclusion attitudes and policies within countries, some of which are culturally rooted while maintaining a political distance? Yeah, it, it, uh, Isabel, it cuts a little bit. Can you repeat it? Sorry for that. Sorry. Uh, we are sometimes told that CIMIT must remain apolitical. How can we influence social inclusion attitudes and policies within countries, some of which are culturally rooted while maintaining inclusion attitudes and policies within countries? Yeah, it's cutting, but let me see if I got it, no? Uh, the, the, one of the characteristics of CIMIT is that it's a political uh, uh, but uh, how we engage in this discussion of social inclusion when it is embedded with cultural norms, no? it's, it's what Tom is trying to ask. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Sorry that it's, it's chopping a little bit, so I was 
uh, getting only some pieces of information. So I would say that uh, we have been unpacking politics in a very, um, like in a black box. And I will say that we really need to unpack the idea of politics and, and a political. So I, I will say, yes, there are some elements of the politics of the countries in which we don't really need to engage, like when um, there are political parties for deciding what side to take, and these political parties are, are engaged in, in visions. But uh, there are other elements of politics that is related with power that are very important and are crucial if we think that we are also engaging the, these SDGs. So in that sense, it, this arena of finding social transformation for promoting equality, it's a very, very important role that we have to engage. It's like, uh, it's, it's in line of, of uh, contributing to hum human rights. And in that sense, we are engaged, we are already committed as signing to the SDGs in which we are looking for gender equality. So I will say that we have to unpack a little bit in what way we are apolitical and in what way we engage for achieving our goals and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the goals that we're looking to move as a part of our mission and as a part of our vision. Thank you. Uh, we have another one uh, from Naslum Alam Siko. Um, he says, or she says, sorry. We are often asked to ask the gender inclusion into our activities by the donors. But I have found most of our colleagues having very little or no training, no knowledge on gender. As a result, the gender remains only in the number of participants. Don't you think this perception should be changed? Yeah, and that's the point of my seminar, that we really have to engage with you in a, in a, a deeper conversation for you starting having more elements to know how to integrate. Gen, it's, it, it will become always like, um, as in, in any topic, there is this arena of the speciality, but there's this uh, uh, arena of the general knowledge that all this, the CIMIT staff should know about gender and social inclusion. And I think that we have to work, work in this general knowledge, minimum general knowledge that, for instance, UN is managed by giving a, a force course on gender for all the persons who participate in UN. We have to ensure that minimal knowledge for being able to, to, to move in the, the topic and also to bring that gender expertise for specific things. I agree completely with you, and that's the intention of this seminar. Thank you. Also, we have a comment and endorsement from Dr. Olaf Ernstein, uh, Director of Global Socioeconomics. Um, he says, leaving no one behind is a core focus to funders. CGR funders are currently asking how many poor people we intend to reach with our germoplasm product profiles. This is no longer an after, through, or complementary aspect. It becomes core to our business, business sorry, it becomes core to our investment case at CIMIT. Um, we have another question from uh, Praia, and it, um, the question is, how would you predict the future social identity and gender space for women in dynamically changing developing countries, economies, sorry? How do you predict mm, social well, identity? I, mm -hmm and gender space for women in a dynamically changing developing economies? Well, um, I have more elements for Latin America, especially for Mexico, and I find it very challenging. It's like um, uh, there's, uh, in the case, for instance, of Mexico, there has been very fights. Uh, a lot of um, the March 8 was very, very strong fight of women trying to bring the topic of, of domestic violence and, and it has been a very hard topic because uh, men has, have been feeling like they are challenged, that they are vulnerable in the claims that women are doing related with domestic violence. No? Now with the COVID, for instance, the cases of domestic violence in, in, in Mexico or reported domestic violence have been increasing. So I think that it's going to be a tough fight in relation with how we can move forward in such a way to find a new way to, re to new social relations in a way that um, we recognize uh, important changes. No, I, I find it, at least for the case of, of Mexico, a very, very difficult fight 
in which we have to find sometimes middle points, but really, really also focusing that domestic violence is not acceptable, for instance. I Thank hope you. that I answered that one. It's a tough one. Uh, we have another one from Titus Dofo. Uh, gender mainstreaming often, often contradicts with social inclusion in terms of women participation in general. As CIMIT involves and works with women of developing countries, how CIMIT mainstream underserved women, underserved women in research? Yeah, but, mm, uh, can you repeat the last part, please? How do yes. How CIMIT mainstream underserve women in research? As CIMIT involves and works with women of developing countries, how CIMIT mainstream underserve women in research? In research. Um, uh, sorry, I don't get completely that question. Uh, but as a way of replying, what is my understanding is, is that. Um, as I was saying, sometimes gender gender is not the main constraining factor for inequalities. It's playing a role, but not. So if you you are able to play with the gender and the social inclusion way in a complementary um, manner, you could see that perhaps it's not gender, but perhaps indigeneity or age, the, the constraining factor that is it's, 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 it's limiting the access to the opportunities. So that's why we need both lenses. Uh, that's why we feel comfortable with talking with gender and social inclusion because we can cover more with that. I hope that I am answering that question. Sorry if I'm not, and I will be very happy if the person wants to send me an email and with more time and answer that one. Thank you, Juan. Another one from Victor Lopez. Uh, thanks, a lot. thanks a lot for your presentation, Carolina. How would you suggest social inclusion can do de facto be observed across CIMIT, across CIMIT's worldwide portfolio of operation? Are there in-house produced materials or practical guides that project leaders can follow as a starting point regardless of the region of operation? Mm -hmm. uh, Genovate has generated a lot of material, practical material that try to be useful for answering some questions. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, if you well, if you enter to the gender unit uh, webpage, you can find those materials accessible. The other thing, is sometimes uh, for me, the experience that I have been developing is that it's also case specific, but we are also trying to get into this idea of a common understanding to move forward. But um, I think that the the one of the very very good results of Genovate was generating this practical guides that you can have access on the internet webpage. Thank you. And um, we have another one, another question from Tania Kasayan. You mentioned identify consequences of innovations in social dynamics. Facing recently more commercial linked strategies, what concepts do, you, do we need to consider while develop this kind of projects? Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding very, very important this part about responsible, responsible sourcing, responsible, all these things, because responsible, when you start grasping a little bit of the concept, it's also linked also, it, for some authors, is really attached with sustainability. Sustainability has these three dimensions, that is the ecological, the economic, and the social. And in terms of the social, sometimes sustainability has been has been not so developed as, as as the environmental, for instance. No, in that sense, responsible have been also been attached with solidarity, and solidarity is a term that becomes very, very, very important because it means that if I'm I'm solidar with someone, I'm willing to lose for a common winning goal. And, 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 and I found out that sometimes with these commercial, in these commercial projects, we have to remind that to the companies that it's not a business as usual, but that they have to be willing to lose for a better position for, both, for all of them. So we have to make really, really claims of saying, okay, but this is a situation in which what we are trying to construct is different social relations that are more e equitable 
And if you want to engage with us, us in these new social rela commercial relations, you have to be willing to sacrifice. You have to be willing to change your job, to, to change your business as usual. Because if not, we, we have the risk of becoming only um, intermediators of a relation that perhaps is not unequal and perhaps is not just unfavorable for our final beneficiaries that are farmers. I hope that I answered Thank you, with that. Uh, Mahmoud from Simit um, Bangladesh um, asks, how do we integrate the indigenous knowledge in social inclusion? And how do we may empower women in community-based organization, especially in decision-making? Yeah, in, indigenous knowledge for me has become a very big, big challenge within CIMIT. Um, and well, I, I didn't comment in the presentation, but also we have been doing a lot of this work of documentation. We have not been able to really integrate this traditional knowledge in the way that we are implementing our projects. So I think that that's also like a point of discussion of how we recognizing that CIMIT generates scientific knowledge, find um, a dialogue and with traditional knowledge to see how both together can integrate a better, uh, 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 better interventions ha can co-product. And I, I find that difficult in practice because uh, sometimes uh, traditional knowledge uh, comes with um, cosmo cosmology, com cosmology, with the way that the indigenous people translate and things, things and with rituals. And being a little bit controversial, last time in my seminar, I was saying how in systems where rituals are important, seem it engage in this conversation. Uh, as if we think that sustainability comes and um, with uh, with social recognition and social sustain sustainability, are we trying to straighten identities, or we are not trying? Well, not to straighten, but to to support them or not? And those are questions that uh, I don't have an answer to it. And so it's basically working on that. In relation with the women in the space of community representation. I think that it's also being able to engage in things related with what we call human development. The soft skills in which um, sometimes we don't feel very, very comfortable because we feel that it's more in the arena of the technology uh, and, and the hard skills related with those technologies. But those these elements related to straightening self-esteem, self-confidence, um, leadership courses become also important if we really, really bring this sense of, of social inclusion. And we, we recognize that phenomena as poverty, we cannot really attend them, attend them in an isolated way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are about to finish uh, the time. So we have a few more questions. Uh, Amirul Musa, um, what, would you, what will be your recommendations on research on aging, gender, and social inclusion in terms of Southeast Asia. Hi. Yeah. Southeast Asia. Um, well, um, the first thing that I want to say is that we have a colleague working on gender and social inclusion there that is home. So I'm sure that uh, he's more informed inform about the regional context that I am. I, I have been focusing too much in Latin America. I would love to broader my scope, but my knowledge of East, uh, Southeast Asia is a little bit limited. One of the things that I have been, uh, that I can recognize there, and, and it's something that we have to focus, is on attending on equalities. Imagine that CIMIT, with the work that we are doing, we are generating opportunities, and we are also generating benefits for people for farmers, how we can ensure that those opportunities and those benefits not leave anyone behind, especially um, target populations that we have to attend because we're committed to poverty, because we are committed to, 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 to hunger. And, and, and another important element is like to start trying to challenge our stereotypes, our own stigma. 
one of the big, big challenges that we have when we start discussing about social inclusion is that there are so many stereotypes around topics like poverty. Let me give you an example. I don't know if in South Asia, but at least here in Latin America, especially in Mexico, there's this belief that people is poor because they are lazy, because they don't work, because they don't want to change, because for them it's easy to, to, to get things by hand. No? And it has been very, very difficult to break that because at the end, although there are numbers showing that poor people work harder than rich people, there is this idea that you start from the beginning and say, no, they don't want to work with us because they are not interested. So we need to challenge that and to say, okay, okay, don't stay with that. Start unpacking and start asking them. One of the things also that we are having with youth is this idea, no, is that youth are not interested. But who is saying that youth is interested? Is youth saying that they are not interested? Or it's adult people who are saying they are not interested? Why we are not listening to the voice of the youth? So one of my advices is like, if you want to do research for including women, for including Jews, for including other groups, you start asking them. Thank you. Um, I would like to open the microphone to Dr. Olaf Einstein, for, uh, Director of Global Socioeconomics for final comments, or Dr. Gorban Govards, Regional Representative for CIMIT at the Americas for final comments as we are already um, finished with the time. Thank you. Okay, maybe just briefly, this is uh, Olaf. No, thank you very much, Carolina. And, and looking at the participation and the questions, it's, it's definitely of interest to a number of us. And, and as I mentioned in a comment, it is also very much of interest to, to funders to see how we better integrate the whole social inclusion and, and the reach of number of poor and a number of hungry people in, in what we intend to do. And that will increasingly decide how funders are gonna allocate their resources. So it's, it's critical that we see how to mainstream this. But thank you so much. And thanks everyone across the world for their active interest. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Carolina. Congratulations. We ended this transmission with 90 people online. So thanks a lot. Excellent presentation. Uh, stay safe, take care of each other and those close to you. And let's be gentle. Goodbye. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.